to be part of the defense innovation networks that we have growing. So um, before we get started here, I want to just give a quick opportunity here for you guys to introduce yourselves. So Chase, uh, tell the team here, uh, what is it that you do, kind of a little bit about your career, and uh, what's your passion? Yeah, so uh, Chase Eisenman, career contracting officer, I've got 17, a little over 17 years on active duty, a couple more years left, but about two years ago on the heels of uh, Jorge stepping out uh, of his active or reserve status, General Holt, our two-star head of uh, contracting acquisition for the Air Force, saw what AFORCE was doing in a very new and novel way, and the fact that our career field contracting in particular wasn't catching up and pushing novel contracting capabilities to the edge as quickly as possible so that we could get customers like you, the services and uh, products that you need as quickly as possible. So we stood up an organization called RapidX, Rapid Acquisition Procurement and Industry Development, so that we have an interface and a core cohort of individuals that are leading the way in doing OTs, non-FAR traditional contracting mechanisms, but more importantly, having deliberate conversations with founders and new and emerging technology companies that otherwise wouldn't be engaged by anybody on the other side of the fence. So that's my passion right now, is connecting with founders and new technology companies to educate them on how to work with the government, but more importantly, to inspire my counterparts in the acquisition community to engage more formally with uh, this community and adopt those technologies as quickly as possible. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's super exciting. Again, you know, we worked together back when I was in the Air Force, so a little bit about me. I have 22 years in the United States military. You know, I grew my beard, grew my hair out a little bit. I actually am not retired yet. I'm still a reserve officer, uh, but probably looking to retirement unless uh, great patriots like these guys convince me to come back in just for a little bit longer. Once you serve so long, for so long, you really bleed blue, as they say in the Air Force. So thank you, uh, definitely. He said a lot of acronyms, actually. So that's one thing we're going to do today is we're going to kind of slow it down and help educate you what these acronyms mean um, and really kind of bring you into, like, what's the lexicon uh, of working with the federal government. So, Jeremy, uh, over to you, man. Tell us about your passion, your background, and, uh, man, why are you here today? Yeah, thank you so much. So Jeremy Nelson, when I talks about my passion, as a sergeant on the enlisted side of the military, I have the opportunity to work with your, your spouses, your kids, your family members that you care about. It is my responsibility to make sure that while we go into operating fields like Iraq and Afghanistan, that they are successful, that they're safe, and that above everything else, that they feel like we're part of a team. And a big piece of that is having the correct infrastructure and the resources and the tools and the ability to work together, which you know, as the most dominant Air Force on the planet, a lot of that comes down to the technology we use. And having the opportunity to work on defense ventures and these kinds of activities with you guys really solidifies to me the intention as we go forward in this next era of combat, the difference between that's going to take place. And what I mean by that is there's conventional warfare that you're all familiar with, missiles, tanks, guns, those kinds of things. But we need to start thinking and asking ourselves the questions of what are we doing in the irregular warfare space? Everything that's just below the threshold of combat. That's where I get the great opportunity to work with you guys and get the feedback from our newer airmen because even been in the military for a decade and a half, you, I don't know, they, they come back and they talk about spider smoothies or something. So they come up with new things, right? And I don't necessarily understand it, but I get the chance to help them build it and be the future of tomorrow. And that's literally made possible because you guys are making the choice to go forth into our country and ask, why couldn't we be better? Why couldn't we do more? Why couldn't we be more efficient? And it's, it's a great privilege to be here with you guys. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. So that's another thing. It's like just the, 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 the idea that you made a choice to be here today to learn a little bit more about Defense Academy, Defense Innovation, and hear from you know, great airmen like Jeremy and like Chase is why we're here today. Well, America needs you. In fact, when he talks about kinetic and irregular warfare, those are like kind of big terms. But the thing is, a lot of the military actually uses a lot of technology that has nothing to do with warfare. It's a technology you use every day at home. You know, a lot of people don't know, and Chase, you probably remember, I mean, you and I grew up you know, in the ranks where, you know, your kids were using iPhones and iPads for years, being productive at school and at home and communicating with friends and family, and the Pentagon wasn't allowed to use what your kids were using for about, what, five years or so? Probably more than that. Yeah, probably more than that, five or ten years, because they, their process was 
you know, very antiquated. It's like, oh, it's new technology, it's scary. And there wasn't a real good mechanism for even Apple, as big as a company that it is, to integrate that technology into the day-to-day -day operations of our nation's defense and our federal government, and let alone defense. I mean, you've got defense, it's important, but even our federal government, our congressmen, they, they weren't using those things because they were afraid of that technology. So the great thing about you being here today is that you're taking the first step to saying, how do I connect? And what's been happening recently with a lot of our defense partners is that they're opening up and lower the barriers to entry or removing barriers to entry to have entrepreneurs like yourself be able to present, articulate, and maybe connect to defense needs that we have uh, brewing that comes from the White House on down. I mean, pretty amazing stuff. Great opportunity for our patriots, our citizens, to be part of the American fabric and be part of national security. So really exciting times that we're in. So let's, uh, let's kind of dive into about understanding defense contracting. So real quick, in the audience, um, how, many, how many have actually done anything with the federal government? Raise your hand. Okay, so we got some. So I'm going to ask a follow-on question. How many of you guys feel that this was a real easy endeavor in which to do? Raise your hand. Not one. Not one, right? So again, um, that's really super interesting, and that's what we are here, and that why these gentlemen are on stage today, because we want to help entrepreneurs understand that it is difficult, but there is a way, right? Doing business with the DoD can be difficult, but it doesn't have to be. So without further ado, let's talk about government contracting a little bit, Chase, all right? So um, people say DoD contracting is nothing else like you find in industry. Why is that? Why do you think I think even before we get to the slide, mm -hmm. the first thing mm -hmm. to recognize is as a contracting person, I can only do what a customer like yourself mm -hmm. brings to me to go acquire. Mm -hmm. So if you're not looking to engage with me, I am definitely not looking to engage with you, th this particular yeah. audience, especially with new and novel technology sectors. So uh, from a traditional contracting requirements development process, it has to be finite and something that I can put onto beta.sam, the website that we use to solicit for requirements. And if, it's, if you're sitting in a spark cell somewhere and you don't have a contracting person with you, then it's just ideas hitting each other with no um, ability mm -hmm. to go source those things. So the reason a place like this is so imperative and why AFWorks is here is there as a traditional contracting guy, I can't just go out and search the globe to find new and novel technologies and then go find the customer that needs that. Um, so keep that in mind. If you think it's gonna fit with the government, there is not a logical connection until someone comes to me and says, hey, I have this very specific requirement and by kismet, like today, mm -hmm. I ran into a, a technology company and I know I need that thing. And then the entire requirements process builds from there. And now as a startup and a founder, you're gonna say, well, I'm the only one doing this tech. Well, as a traditional contracting guy, and by rule of the far, I'm gonna say, guarantee you're not, I'm gonna go find out. And I'm gonna pit a competition and find other things and then we get into a whole, maturation process of, well, this is my tech, how can you advertise that and let everybody know that my tech is out? I mean, it, it just becomes very extremely convoluted and it's not B2B. It is not B2B. Mm -hmm. It is my, my default reaction to anything that he brings to me is I'm gonna go find out in the sea of humanity who else is doing anything relatively close and almost give the benefit of the doubt to the competition as opposed to the individual company that came up with the tech. I see a lot of heads going like this. I mean, it's a horrible reality of the situation that we're in. It, it's, it behooves me, and you know this as well as anybody from a contracting perspective, mm -hmm. to do the easy button, which is competition, and just send it out and then see what comes back. And yeah. you may not win as the founder and the owner of the tech, and then you know, if you have millions of dollars in lawyers, then maybe you get somewhere, but mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, maybe not. And you don't end up with the product that you wanted originally. So mm -hmm. it's an incredibly challenging process, and why mm -hmm. that first initial bullet is so important. It's unlike any other business relationship you've ever experienced. Exactly. And that really drives kind of the home the point. I mean, and you probably attest to it just from the very far end of the spectrum, you're receiving the goods. That none of those procurements are the same. You're going to have different timelines, different missions that you're addressing, different requirements, different funding types. All those things are things that you have to be well-educated on as you go in there, and that's why you have to seek Sir Sherpas. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But, you know, from that aspect, 
That's why education up front is so important because you don't want to waste your time as a founder, you know, trying to do government service or government, you know, you know, provide the government any kind of services or products if you don't understand the world that you're going to go in. So in the military, we call that understanding the AOR. We don't go into a fight without knowing what environment we're going into first. So this is another great opportunity for you guys to have questions, right, as we kind of work through here uh, to get to learn that, understand what we're saying, and then uh, find yourself a partner, a good trusted partner that can help you navigate in Sherpa through that world. So one thing that uh, we're going to dr- harp on here towards the end is like find your commercial traction first if as a founder. Get yourself some very solid commercial customers going because that's going to help forward finance your ability to actually do government service. Now, government contracting could be great once you get through this, this what I call the roller coaster, right, ride of, of working with federal government. But when you are on those uh, coasters, it's just like a roller coaster. You might be go slowing, going up, going up, going up. But when you take that ride down, it's fun, it's exciting, it's quick, and then all of a sudden, boom, you stop and you're going back up that hill again. And, it, uh, and that's just kind of the cycles that we do. So um, some of the follow-on things that, you know, you're going to hear stuff like FAR and OTAs and stuff. Chase, tell me a little bit about that. Why should these people care about those types of acronyms? And what is FAR? I mean, what, is, is that us going far away or what is it? <laughs> <laughs> So the Federal Acquisition Regulation is a document that yeah. we, it's our Bible in contracting mm-hmm. and acquisition that dictates how we do what we do. Now, mm-hmm. I will tell you, uh, much like mm-hmm. the Bible, uh, any contracting officer can read a particular line in the FAR a different way and be totally right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you will get frustrated <laughs> as, you, as you have different yeah. uh, acquisition partnerships and customer bases. Well, hey, I did it this way at Travis, and now Edwards mm-hmm. is telling me I have to do it, and they're both right. It's in, entirely frustrating to a founder and any government contractor, uh, frankly. Uh, but that's the key. So the FAR, if you aren't base, don't have a baseline education of what the FAR, again, not B2B, so we're guided by different principles and, and requirements, uh, a general understanding of what that FAR is and how that dictates everything we do. And as a contracting person, I, I will call out from the FAR, this is why I'm doing it this way. And again, another contracting person said, well, my opinion is I would do it in FAR Part 15 or something like that, and they would be totally right. Yeah. It's just a different way of doing things. But the FAR is what guides how we acquire the things we do and why we acquire them the way we do. And we'll get into yeah. types yeah. and things like that here. Exactly. We'll get into those things. So, again, those are the terminologies that it just behooves you as you kind of dive into the defense world. You have to learn these things up front because the more you arm yourself with knowledge, the more successful you're going to be, the better you can mitigate risks, and the more informed you can be when you're on the other side of the table with the federal government. So really awesome. So how many of you guys, real quick, how many of you guys just, does this motivate you or does it scare you? So raise your hand. Does this scare you? Raise your hand. <laughs> a couple, couple. Does it motivate you? Look at that. We got motive. Okay, awesome. I see the motivation kind of outpacing the, the scare, and we got a, a few undecided yet. So hopefully by the end of this, all of you will be motivated to do this. So, all right, next slide, please. I do want to offer one mm-hmm. other contextual mm-hmm. thing just as we get started. Yeah. So from a business standpoint, you understand what success looks like for you, right? Profit margin, uh, paying off investors, things like that, and exit. Uh, when, when you're talking about success for a government uh, employee, uh, you know, we don't operate like a business in the Air Force specifically. I only talk to the Air Force. We're individual business units potentially, uh, but I would go mm-hmm. so far as to say I don't understand maintenance, and they're completely different career, career field. They're graded off different things. Contracting the same way. Our success met- metrics are spending money and as quickly as possible. What gets delivered is ir- irrelevant to the success of my day-to-day operations. That's counterintuitive, right? It doesn't make any sense. But when you're talking to a contracting person, as a, especially as a new startup, you're gonna get frustrated responses that just don't make any sense, but keep that context in mind. I'm graded a very specific way, dollars in, dollars out, as quickly as possible. What Mm -hmm. you get and how successful it is at the end of the day, not my problem, because I didn't write the requirement. Mm -hmm. Just keep that context in (laughs) mind. It's not helpful, but at least in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, okay, I understand where he's coming from as opposed to where the customer's coming from. Jeremy, go ahead. I know you know. You've received the other end of that, so go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So the piece that I would give is kind of when I try to explain to a a bunch of 18-year-olds who didn't want to go to college, why should we read federal acquisition regulations? I try to help them understand the point 
is to be able to show due diligence in taxpayer dollars. Because we're spending the country's money. It's not our money. So when you look at this process, you have to understand it's not, I earned 50 bucks, so I'm going to go buy myself whatever I want. It's the taxpayer's money. So we have these rules and regulations and policies to show the due diligence so that there is, we're impartial, we're fair, we're equitably sharing the opportunity. But when it comes to the end state product, I would suggest get with your teapot, get with your stakeholder, because they are the ones who are communicating the value of the tool, and they are the ones who will give you the outlined requirement, because the contractors aren't going to know that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, you're, that's like asking the guy who's a marksman with special forces, and then you ask the contractor, like, hey, what kind of scope should we get him? The, the guy <laughs> who's shooting is going to tell you what kind of scope he wants, not the contractor. Yeah. Yeah, that very, very good point. And, you know, he, again, dropping acronyms, TPOX, oh, stakeholders, yeah. right? We're going to have a bunch of great folks here coming here later. We got UTSA and the PTAC, you know, their procurement assistance centers here in, in Texas. We also have uh, some great partners uh, in cyber advisors are going to help kind of demystify what all these things are, why you want a TPOC, why they're important, all that stuff. So we'll get there. Um, so... I want to just say, like, right now, you're probably thinking, okay, okay, okay I got a, got a basic idea. It's a little intimidating, but I think I might want to be a part of it. So where, where do you fit? I'm sure you're probably asking, where do I fit in? So let's talk a little bit about things you're going to hear, like traditional and non-traditional contractors. What does that mean, right? So Chase, give us, enlighten us a little bit as to that and why it's important for them to know the difference between that uh, non-traditional and a traditional Contractor. So I think the easiest way to explain it and, and understand mm -hmm. it is someone who, a company that's hyper-focused on government as their primary profit margin, traditional. Everyone else that's hyper-focused on the commercial marketplace is, I would just term, non-traditional. So mm -hmm. if you have a, a very robust commercial product and you're driving profit and everything else, you're in that non-traditional uh, sector. You're not focused on every day driving up market price based on the next war kicking off or something like that. Yeah, really good. And the really good thing is that m most entrepreneurs, I won't say all, never use, you know, all the definitives, but most entrepreneurs fall under the non-traditional defense contractor. And that's actually a really, really good thing. You know, to be a, tr a defense contractor means, like, you're going to put in lots of investment, you're large, you're probably going to be making what we call kinetic weapons, things that go boom, right? If you want to go in that space, that's cool. Go for it, but it's going to be a long journey. I mean, if you don't believe us, look back at SpaceX when that opened up, right, to compete in NASA. Their journey didn't happen overnight. I mean, Elon Musk built his wealth and built his company over a long time now, over 20 years now, and they're still, they're still kind of in growth mode, right, with, with all these crazy ideas and stuff. So just be, you know, cage yourself where you need to be. You know, you want to be able to identify as a non-traditional company, and, and the reasons for is there's a couple of really good reasons why you want to stay on the commercial space. So can you just give us a little, elaborate a little bit on that, Chase, as to commercial and why it's important just to stick in that area for now? Yeah, so mm -hmm. in the last two years I've been doing this gig, the number one thing that I have seen be a, a metric of success for folks to transition to government sales is 18, at least 18 months of capital runway. Mm -hmm. How do you get there? Commercial uh, sales. So that's step one. Step two, being a non-traditional, small by another term, uh, and I don't want to dive into the whole how SBA determines all that, but when you're small, you're non-traditional, it opens up the FAR, the aperture on capabilities that I can use to acquire your technologies uh, at a scope and magnitude that just can't compared to a traditional large business. I mean, I, mm -hmm. agility, yeah. speed to procurement, payment structures, mm -hmm. all those kind of things open up to you that uh, big traditional yeah. government contractors just can't get access to. Yeah, and that's really kind of the bottom line. Read, if you want to get to market faster, be a non-traditional, sell commercially. Why? Because you're going to have a, a expedited procedures, expedited payments, all kinds of different things that open up to you as a small business that the large prime or defense contractor, per se, traditional, is likely not going to get. So you have a lot of advantages of working in that space. Now it's the idea is how do you strategize and how to use that capability to become a dominant competitor inside the non-traditional marketplace. All right, so let's jump to the next slide, please. All right, 
So I want you guys to ask, like, you know, we, what does the DOD buy? Like, tell me. I mean, you guys tell me from the crowd. What do you think the DOD buys? <laughs> now, look at that. Well, he read the slide. He buys everything. You're right. They do buy everything. Um, what, are, what are the kind of things that, I mean, some of you guys have already sold to the government. So let me, let me raise your hand. Tell, tell us if you can tell us what you sell the government. Go ahead. Right, right there in the back, ma'am. Okay, research. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, they, they actually, we buy research. Okay, whom else? Jonathan. Training. Training? All right. Training, training system. Okay, anybody else in there? What else are you guys putting out that's different than training and research? Go ahead. Koozies for your cell phones and tablets. Koozies for your cell phones and tablets. Yeah, kind of random. You're like, oh my gosh, why would they buy that, right? But no, it's true. They buy anything. How about you? Uh, body fat tests. Body fat test? Okay, that's cool. So you're selling that to the government? Yes. That's cool. Who's your customer? Uh, Florida Silvermore National Labs. That's cool. And what are they going to do for, to help you scale? Uh, they buy it. They <laughs> buy it. <laughs> do you know where but, it goes from there? Yeah. Uh, so their employees use it. Okay. Um, their employees use it to uh, kind of measure for health, wellness, all of those other yes. things. It's kind of like a perk that they, they enjoy yeah. offering. See, and that, that's really good. I'm glad that you came up, right? Because here's another thing that people forget. When you're in the defense innovation, it doesn't mean you have to always sell and get traction from the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, per se. There's a lot of other stakeholders in the entire ecosystem that actually are kind of quasi-governmental or they're a laboratory, but they're still government, right? So if you are here saying, I'm going to be razor-focused to sell to the Army, well, you're limiting yourself. You need to say, I am going to be selling to the federal government, to the state government, to the local governments, and now you open up your aperture. Because just like you might have koozies, maybe the Army doesn't want the koozies for their cell phones, but the laboratory might, the body fat testing right? You might go to the Air Force and say, hey, this is going to save your PT stuff, whatever. We're, we need that. And they're like, yeah, we agree, but it's going to take you five years. But that laboratory is like, I'll do it. I'll do it. And they'll start right now. So just make sure that you understand, again, understanding that operating environment in which you're going to be selling for. So that's very good. So go ahead. DOD has set aside $100 million for anything that crosses services, that they'll come in across the top and add funds in uh, beyond what the service is gonna put in. So if you can peanut butter spread across DOD specifically mm -hmm. for that 100 million, but you know, DARPA coming in on top too, mm -hmm. we can always find more money if more people, more services mm -hmm. components want uh, this, the stuff. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, so, yep. go ahead. So does the DOD, can you contract directly with the DOD or would they say, you know what, we're gonna get that goods or services from GSA, from your general services? Or do they avoid using the non-traditional DOD agencies to do their procurement? Because that's a good example. Why, did he, why is he able to do a DOD contract mm -hmm. when he could have sold it to GSA and then the DOD gets, it, gets that service or product from, uh, from the other parts of the, of the government? Yeah, I'm going to say mm -hmm. this is opinion-based. <laughs> it kind of depends on the TRO level and whether mm -hmm. you know, other entities that are reviewing the technology believe that it's at a level that it could be commercially procured. So if you're doing a, a direct to, to customer sale, mm -hmm. they may take on a bit more risk on the outcome of that, mm -hmm. whereas a bigger organization like the DAF, you know, Department of the Air Force in general, would be like, oh, if it's not on GSA, mm -hmm. we're not going to consume it. So, From a vendor's perspective, which is easier? I know that's going to be hard to answer. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ease of execution, GSA is certainly easier. Uh, we can satisfy all competition requirements within GSA. When we go direct to, to customer, mm -hmm. we may have to get into a justification approval for sole source or things like that. So uh, it, yeah. it really, uh, it's, there's so much contextual activity around the actual technology itself. It's really hard to answer that just right off the cuff. Yeah. The uh, on the board of a... Uh, U.S. Navy contractor in San Diego. Mm -hmm. I actually did two questions. And the, 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 the challenges we're having, is it by branch? Are some branches less complicated <laughs> than other and, and to the Navy? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. I mean, we... I mean, yeah. 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 I mean, you'd be better off asking these guys. I mean, I can only speak yeah. for the Air yeah. Force. I know... Yay! <laughs> Woo! 
Look at that. I love it. Yeah. And I would offer too, just within the Air Force, it depends on which MANCOM you're working with. Some, yeah. again, yeah. Some, you know, yeah. SOCOM or mm -hmm. AFSOC, someone like that is very forward leaning. They have their own money, so they can mm -hmm. do different things. Then you get into mm -hmm. AFMC, Air Force Material mm -hmm. Command, it's very traditional yeah. and uh, by the letter of the law. Yeah. So. And, and the thing that we're going to learn over your journey, you know, especially today, you're going to meet with other partners. So, you know, is it, you know, it's very subjective because even Air Force, yeah, I love Air Force. We're probably the easier one to go with because we're just kind of very forward leaning on our acquisitions. But at the same time, other services have groups that do really well as well. It's really almost personality based. So it depends on what team and what office you're going to. If you've got people who are very passionate, they really want to drive things forward, you're, you get lucky, right? And you're going to move fast. If you end up with a customer who's like, not, that's afraid, is, 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 is hiding behind the regs, you're going to see that it's going to become very cumbersome, right? So it's really, it's, you, you can't really say one's better than the other. It just depends, you know, honestly. Yeah, and, and, then, you know. and what I can imagine mm -hmm. is happening is you mm -hmm. have a very excited customer base or share, stakeholder, mm -hmm. someone in the Navy that wants exactly what you have. Mm -hmm. And then again, remembering the metrics for success for acquisition mm -hmm. and contracting, mm -hmm. you have someone over here in the bureaucracy mm -hmm. that's saying, yeah. no, not, not right. going to move fast enough, not interested. Yeah. And they have every right to say that because they're being graded a completely different yeah. way. That last point mm -hmm. is your chance to plug Texas. The challenges <laughs> we're having in California, yeah. where the hell do they think they can have jurisdiction over DOD contracts? <laughs> where they are imposing regulations on contractors in San Diego that are making mm. your cost costs or uh, contracts just out of line. Or does, the, or does the DOD say, you know, we can't encourage you to leave California, a lot of Democrats there, um, or, you know, so we'll give you a, a little slightly better margin if you're contracting out of California than out of mm. Texas. I can tell you unequivocally, we would never have that as an evaluation factor, yeah. period, dot. Yeah. You can't limit competition by that, you know, when it comes down to it. It's not really kind of a DOD or something. It's really, again, you've got to go back to the federal acquisition regulation. You have to compete to the maximum extent possible. If you're limiting competition by something that actually reduces competition unfairly, then that normally is, you know, that's where the lawyers come in and say, you've got to throw that out. So if that's happening, I mean, honestly, I can't speak to it at that level. I, I think... You know, whatever's happening in California is a California thing, so we don't get kind of into the state politics and stuff that's going on. What I can't, we, we'll yeah, get to your question in one mm -hmm. second. What I can mm -hmm. offer from a major mm -hmm. defense tech uh, contractor, mm -hmm. you know, Lockheed and other one. So one thing that General Holt is pushing, mm -hmm. he's calling flipping the script. Mm -hmm. So, But we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts now. Yeah. For, so traditionally what happens for major mm -hmm. weapon systems mm -hmm. or major uh, mm -hmm. DAF-wide contracting acquisitions, a, a major defense contractor can come in and lose money for five years. Mm -hmm. A startup, a founder, a small business can't do that. So that eliminates mm -hmm. competition right there. So what General Holt's trying to do is it's mandatory in your response to the solicitation how you as a company will make profit the first year. So that levels the playing field across major acquisition. Whether that gets picked up and the lobbyists don't kill that <laughs> as, it, as it moves yeah. through our mechanisms to roll it out is a question, but yeah. to your point, how do we compete across the, the major weapon system program mm -hmm. or major programs in general, regardless of our where we are uh, headquartered or anything like that? That's part of what we're trying to do is make sure that a company can't buy mm -hmm. in and eliminate everybody else from the competition yeah. pool. Yeah, we're gonna, real quick to kind of keep this moving, I wanna just make sure that obviously we have a whole lot of different opportunities, 14 key modernization areas that we're looking at. So if you're looking at actually being part of the defense innovation and selling to defense, two things. There are 14 areas that are up there. I'd love for you guys to take out your phone and click on that QR code if you can get it from the screen from your phone. Not sure if it'll work from where you're at. Uh, it should be up on these bigger screens as well, uh, lower right. And I'm going to just show you the defense innovation marketplace real quick. So Ben, if you don't mind clicking on the actual visit the defense innovation marketplace, and uh, I just want to give them a quick look um, to <laughs> this actual marketplace. I mean, this is the best place for you guys to find opportunities across the entire DOD, uh, we'll right? We'll go back to the QR code for y'all. Yep. We'll go, we'll go back to the QR code in a minute after Ben yep. shows you yep. the website. Yep, so I'm just going to show you, if you We're scroll down to the quick. bottom, Ben, I just go all the way to the bottom. You see that uh, list right there? It says contract opportunities. 
And Ben, if you click on, I believe it's the very, uh, the, the We know it's a little like, small. Response date. Click on the response date. That's a great way to sort it. You just do response date. And then you'll see that right there. And I'm going to look back because my eyes are failing me and I can't see that far. But right here, you see, you got Air Force, Army, Navy. Um, and as you go down that list, it goes all the way up to opportunities that close in 2024. So you've got time. And if you look at this list, Here's like the very first, oh, look at that. Siri's talking. Siri's like calling me. Um, Microcircuits Innovation for Next Generation Systems Advancement Validation, Advanced Research Calls. That closes in 2024, and they have a solicitation number. That's what I want to point you to. That solicitation number for you guys is gold, right? Because you can look at this list, see what best fits you, and we're going to talk about connecting you to different avenues for not only opportunities for business, right, that you can solicit to, um, but at the same time, who you might want to partner with to get to those. And we have like defense partners that are willing to work with entrepreneurs. Today, you're going to hear from some of them. You got De uh, Deloitte that's going to be here today. And you have other like large primes that are very interested in working on entrepreneurs like BAE Systems. Um, they're, they're here and in and around our ecosystem. But when you look at this, this website, it's the easiest way to get a solicitation number. Then you go to a place that they call uh, betasam.gov. I don't think it's beta anymore. Sam.gov. And you put in that solicitation number, and it's going to pull up all the information that you need to know on how to write a proposal to answer that and try and get some of that non-dilutive capital, right? So I love this site because everything you need to know, it's like a board, and it actually consolidates the opportunities from all the DOD, you know, to include uh, some of our laboratories like DARPA and, and other agencies that are typically what we call the fourth estate which are DOD-like, but they're not, they don't fall under the services, right? So wanted to show that, uh, if you can get back to the slides. So yeah, um, we, obviously we're going to share these slides, but that QR code, again, is available for you guys. Um, and let's, let's, let's go on to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, trying to make it a little interactive here. So now we're going to go continue down. We have uh, another 15 minutes, so I want to get through more of the basics of contracting, right? Things that you need to know. So um, again, you heard a little bit about FAR and non-FAR, so federal acquisition regulations, and then you're going to start hearing people say, well, this is a non-FAR kind of uh, you know, situation that I'm in, right? You're going to hear government say that. Well, non-FAR is really a statutory agreement. And when you talk about different types of agreements inside the federal acquisition regulations and things that are outside the federal acquisition regulations, those are all just various types of business arrangements. Let's break it down to basic English right? In commercial industry, you have different business arrangements that you might do commercially. Well, the government has the same thing, and that all these business arrangements fall under the FAR, which is all the regulations that, that do commercial contracting for us and also non-commercial contracting. And then you have non-FAR, which are agreements, which really dictates and gives the government flexibility to do R&D and to do prototyping and to do small-scale manufacturing on technologies that aren't readily available in the commercial marketplace, right? That need maturation. So Chase, give me a little bit more about this contracting cone and understanding some of those, those nuances. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak to this mm -hmm. real quick and then I wanna get to the mm -hmm. next chart because it's sure. the money for you guys. Yeah. So the blue part there, mm -hmm. so we've got about 8,400 contracting people in the Air Force right mm -hmm. now between uh, military and civilian. Of that, about 5% has ever done anything in the R&D research and development world, so thinking AFRL, AFRS, mm -hmm. and those type. Of that 5%, about 5% has done anything in the green. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that green section, and uh, Kevin, if he was sitting here, would probably be shaking his head. That's where uh, we have the most uh, leniency, uh, OTA for prototyping, different things like that. It, it's an exper experimental process through contracting. Uh, but no one knows how to use it. And uh, because it's not blue 52 and blue being <laughs> perfect for the cone there, uh, we get a lot of pushback in general from the acquisition community because they don't understand it. Uh, it, it because it's new and interesting, it's something they would have to learn. They don't have to learn that because they could do the mm -hmm. blue stuff. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you were getting advice from someone that OTA or uh, CSO mm -hmm. or some kind of consortium makes the most sense, you're gonna be frustrated in trying to sell that back to an acquisition professional who ha doesn't live in that world every single day through AFRL or other organizations like that. So uh, 
Blue is what you're going to see the most, specifically with co commercial, ready, mm -hmm. you know, TRL level yeah. 10 and above uh, commercial available items. So next slide real quick, and we'll get into yeah. why this is important. So as a government, where do I want all the risk to be all the time? On me or on you? On you. Yeah. So we're going with firm fixed price, right? I'm going to set a price. Well, you are going to propose a price to me. We will negotiate. We'll agree on that price. Whether you deliver at that price or not is totally on you. So you could make 50% profit or lose 50%. That is, the, that is the prescription for success from the government. Get to firm fixed price as early and as often as possible, period, dot. Mm -hmm. Shift all the yeah. risk to the contractor and don't share any of that risk from the government perspective. Now, cost plus fixed fee, not... 100% risk uh, to the government, but now we're sharing it, right? So you're gonna get a fee, which we will negotiate, and then your costs will have to be submitted for review. I will, as a contracting person, approve anything that is uh, allow, what are they, allowable and allowable applicable. and allocable. <laughs> yeah, that. Allowable and allocable. <laughs> yeah, so keep that in mind. So the ease of contract activity is firm fixed price. We mm -hmm. all agree at the outset what, it, what you will be paid after you know, lot is delivered, or performance is executed, and then cost plus fixed fee is where we start to share risk. What I will warn you on cost plus fixed fee is you have to have an audit from DCA, Defense Contract Audit Agency, yep. and that can be a significant initial cost for you as a company that you may not have the capital uh, to get after. So. Yeah. Uh, Yep. So, There's a large yeah. in my world mm -hmm. right now in, in uh, Stratify Tafi, which I can talk to you about offline or cyber contracts, things like that. There's a uh, some some contractors want, contracting mm -hmm. officers want to do cost plus fixed fee. They're trying to work with the contractor and share some of that risk mm -hmm. because it's R and D. It's new and interesting. We don't know if it'll work. Uh, most will do firm fixed price, but that's an incredibly risky alternative to the company, especially if you're doing research and development work. Yeah, and, and the reason for that is early stage, right? You know, when you're doing cost plus fixed fee, you have to have an approved accounting system. It's CAS, right? Cost accounting standards, which the government uses uh, to make sure that your books are in line. There's a cost involved. So when you're a small com business, you may not be set up that way. That's why we go back to co commercial traction being most important. I always tell all my founders, when you are getting into the business with the government, you want to make sure that you split your company about 80. If you want to do dual use, where you go and actually have the government as a, as a potential client, make sure that you can balance your books to show 80% commercial business, 20% government. And you want to do that in the early days because you've got to build your revenue. So when you do want to do things right, with the government, you want to share the risk on a cost reimbursal basis, you can actually afford to have, you know, get your books in line in a way that the government can be acceptable for. So it's a good thing to get to that point, but on the early stages, as you first kind of dip your toe in with the government, really go for that firm fixed price. And not only that, know your product and secure your value. If you don't know your product, you don't know what it costs, don't depend on just going by what the budget is. So yeah, I'm gonna ask you, how many times have you seen airmen say, this is my budget? And whatever. What are your experience with that? Like, I want to buy something, and I know this is how to have. Tell me a little bit about your experience on your end about that, and then I'll tell you why why that's a pitfall. Yeah. So, I've I've seen plenty of airmen. You know, they get out of high school, they join the military, and it's most likely the first time that they've gotten money that they didn't earn by mowing lawns or doing groceries and stuff like that. And so they go out and they buy a, a Mercedes or something like that, and then they're hanging out at the gate. You can hear their stomach grumbling, and you're like, hey, man, do you need us to get, like, the patrol to get us food and whatnot? They're like, no, I don't have any money. And you're like, we just got paid yesterday. What do you mean you don't have money? And they're like, well, you know, I didn't factor in that I only make this much in a month, and the car payment is actually double what I make in that month, so I can't actually afford food. So budgeting is really important. You have to factor that into when you're trying to get the government to buy something, you have to get them to understand what is the upfront cost and then what is the net gain that they earn over time with that. And you have to get that from the, this, this end stakeholder themselves. So from the, the person that you're engaging, not the contracting office, you have to get them to articulate to you 
why are we buying this? What is it worth? And then what is the value to the DOD enterprise that we're benefiting from that is mitigating that cost? So what are we replacing? And that way is a very amenable when you try to get us to go to higher levels and pitch our ideas to be replace an existing product. Yeah, and one thing that's just super important about that is a lot of times you'll get, you'll, you'll find a champion, somebody in the Air Force, somebody in the Navy, Air, uh, Army, says, hey, I really love your product. I've got a budget. They'll say, my budget is $50,000, $100,000, $200,000, right? Know your value. Because that might be a great way to say, yeah, I can go in there. But first of all, can they make that decision? Second of all, does that money, is that really equate to what you're going to bring in value? Because if you're undercutting yourself, you're going to now set a precedent. You might set yourself up for losing money, a failure. So you need to know your value before you really commit. Even though they might have a budget, don't go after that budget. Know what your value is and propose what you can do for their end state with what you feel is what you need to cover costs and obviously make your profit so you could stay in business and grow your business, right? And so, quickly, yeah. from that perspective, uh, one of the primary responsibilities for a contracting officer is to write a mm -hmm. price negotiation memorandum mm -hmm. and have an objective. Well, if you're a new novel technology company mm -hmm. and I have nothing else to grade it against, yep. I'm going to do some market research and maybe come up with some wildly outlandish poorly aligned numbers that I'm going to make my ob objective against, and you're going to have to justify back to me why you, uh, what you're proposing makes the most sense and is uh, a good uh, business transaction for the government. And you probably aren't going to be able to help that very much. Yeah. <laughs> you're excited about the product, yeah. but the numbers yeah. behind that may not make sense. So that's why you have to very thoroughly know what you're worth and yeah. why in comparison to the rest of the market. Because yeah. if I can get close to a product, and I'm like, oh, it only cost me 50 bucks over here yeah. to get Adobe, but I need, you know, times X capability, I may not factor, if I'm not a savvy contracting person, may not factor that in. And mm -hmm. at that point, the contracting officer can just say, nope, not going to do this. You're mm -hmm. out of your product. Mm -hmm. You're stuck mm -hmm. with a RFP response yeah. that didn't go anywhere. All right. And then not all money is green. Yeah, not all money <laughs> is green. That, that is, that's correct. So moving right along, we're, we're almost to the end here. We're getting really great questions. There are a lot of good feedback, but part of the basics is understanding money. Not all money is green. Uh, just like he says, we have federal appropriations. Well, you'll hear it called colors of money, which equals budget allocation. So just like at home, you got budgets, right? You got a budget to pay for groceries. You got a budget to pay for your utilities, a budget to like pay your mortgage. Well, when you talk about appropriations and colors of money, it's the same thing. The government's got the same thing, literally. It's almost a ledger with a checkbook. And the government, I mean, the country's massive. So all it is is budgets for different needs that the United States requires to operate and stay viable as a vibrant economy. So talk to me a little bit more about colors of money. And let's, let's, let's tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly there and what they should be looking out for, Chase. Yeah, so one of the biggest points I make to new mm -hmm. emerging technology companies is, especially because I work so closely with Super Sitter and research and development funds, anyone that you're working with or aligned with in the government that has research and development funds that they're applying to your contract, that is not a customer, that is a partner. We are in this to figure out if your tech works. And if it does, awesome. Maybe we'll get to something later on that transitions to operations and maintenance, and that's sustained money and consumption of your product. So keep that in mind. If you have a relationship with AFRO, with AFWorks, with anyone, and it's, it's research and development funds, that is a partnership. That is not a government-customer relationship. That money will go away. It's supposed to. Your TRL lo level raises. You transition to commercial consumption. Now you're talking about O&M or procurement sometimes if we're mm -hmm. in AFL-CMC. So uh, those are the two big ones. Mm -hmm. Research and development, great money. It, uh, Pretty easy to access, especially through Cibber and Sitter, based on your size standard for your company. That is a partnership. The, that money will mm -hmm. go away, and it's finite in the amount that you can earn for R&D. O&M is where you want to mm -hmm. live. That's sustained uh, uh, consumption mm -hmm. of your commercial product at that point. Yeah. Let me give that also a little concept. So you guys, there are different stages of your technology and product. If you have a commercial product that you want to integrate in the military and people are excited about, you might for lack of a better term, and want to you know, color it a different color. So for example, I got an iPhone, I want it to be camouflaged. Well, it's going to cost you money to do that. So what you want to do is get you know, programs that give you research and development dollars so you can do the development or the research required to turn that phone from black to camouflage. 
That, what it does as you as a business owner is that it reduces your risk because now the federal government, the taxpayer is paying you because there's somebody at the other end. We have a user like Jeremy who says, I really like that, but I need it to be camouflaged. Now you use the government's taxpayer money and R&D dollars to get it from that TRI level, which is, you know, it might be mature, but you need to move it over so the government can use it, right? And use those dollars to get your product to that point. That could take months, you know, depending on what your product is, it could take years. But that's what you use rdt and &E. But once you get that, just like Chase is saying, that money then goes away. So you already have to be working with your government partner to say, okay, once I turn this from my black phone to a camouflage phone, now I want to be able to sell you a million phones per year. That's where you got to make sure that somebody in the government says, I agree. We agree that we're going to buy a bunch of uh, camouflage phones. So you got to make sure that your partner has handed you off to the folks that are going to use the operations and maintenance money or the O&M appropriation to be able to buy millions of phones a year. And if and you that, haven't heard this before, mm -hmm, just last point mm -hmm. on this slide, if I want your camouflage mm -hmm. phone right now today, I needed to ask for it four years ago. Yeah. Four years ago. Mm -hmm. So anything that I see today that I want in the portfolio, mm -hmm. I need to wait four years to get to operations and maintenance yeah. at scale. Now, certainly we could probably find $50,000, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if we're talking about scale, mm -hmm. something that you can mm -hmm. sell to an investor on yeah. consumption of your product, we're talking almost yes. four years from yeah. today. And that's why it's so important to be part of these types of ecosystems. Because as you embark in your journey, it's not impossible, but you've got to create a go-to market strategy. So that, again, we'll go back to your commercial traction, right? Work on your commercial traction and have some person working on your go-to market strategy to go execute and you have a plan to get the rdt and &E and knowing that over a certain amount of time, you're gonna to have to work and pitch for that O&M to come through. Because and why, the reason it's that, it's not because it's slow, it's because Congress has to appropriate the money. They have to know that there's a new camouflage phone that the DOD needs and right now, the process in Congress takes that long. So if you wanna change it, don't, don't scream at the generals. Don't scream at, go to your congressman. Say, we need to go there. So, you know, when we're talking about how do you influence change in your country, that's where your congressmen come in. And if you as entrepreneurs collectively come together and say, this is way, and we got great capability, but we can't wait four years. We can wait two. Can we change it from four to two? And maybe you might change something like that. So just wanted to kind of put that out there, and it's something that we could all work together. Now, one last thing. Let's, let's jump up to the next slide. We've got our... Oh my gosh, what are we seeing here? Extreme caution. What's going on there, Chase? I mean, why do we want to exercise caution when we're talking about money and being on government contracts and who you make friends with in the government? Tell us so a little bit about very that. Very quickly, if, a contracting, if you're not talking to a contracting officer, specifically a contracting officer, and anybody else in the federal government tells you to do anything or implies anything or asserts anything, don't do it. That's on you, that's 100% risk on you. There may be legal liability on that other person, but that's a long process. Bottom line is, if you're not talking to a contracting person, they're not instructing you on what to do specific to a contract that is in action, uh, don't listen to the other person, <laughs> period, dot. Or you will, you will consume the cost of doing anything that uh, you do in response to anybody else's instruction besides a contracting officer. Yeah. Period, dot. Yeah, that's the very, very first thing. So. You know, we've got great champions like Jeremy. I mean, you're a champion, right? But can you execute the money that your commander has given your airmen? No. Yeah. I'm, I'm the use case that you use to justify to hire leadership that this is valuable based upon the price that you're discussing, and then the contracting office has to authorize it with the commander in place. So we are, we are your ambassadors. We are the ones who communicate the need and the value, but we cannot authorize that the funds are exchanged. Yeah, so they're very powerful. That's why we call them champions. They can be your ambassador. They can advocate. They can even sell the, the opportunity to the people who are going to say, yes, let's go ahead and cut these checks out and then give it to the contracting officer to go execute. So when you meet these folks and your end users inside the government, make sure that you ask your champion, do you know your contracting team? Do you know your budget and finance team? Do you know, does, does your commander know, right, that this is something that you guys need? And make sure that you create an ecosystem and a coalition of those folks working together. That's how you can help Sherpa and, and help them move along because they don't all necessarily know to do that. Jeremy does. I mean, he's passionate about this. But that's why the government really on the acquisition side really works as a team.
So some other th- kind of things that I want to make sure that we all exercise caution on. It's like, if you actually get one of the contracts, let's say you get a silver contract, let's say you get an OT or whatever, you're like, man, I'm, I'm a big patriot, and uh, I'm going to get this project done, but I'm going to have to spend another $250,000 of my capital or my investment, personal or otherwise, to get this across the finish line. Don't do that. You know, once you've given, the government's given you a certain project to do, you work to the limit that you can because if you try and go above and beyond and you spend your own personal capital, there is no requirement for the DOD to repay you for your patriotism. They're paying you to what the letter of the contract says. That's number one. Number two, one thing that we've seen a lot is sometimes you have a lot of champions that get overzealous. You got program managers. You got people in offices that are saying, I want this so bad. Jonathan, keep working. You know, I'm going to get you your contract. Your document will come one day. And what they do is, for whatever reason, they'll try and encourage you. They'll beg you. They'll cajole you. They'll plead. They'll, they'll, they'll persuade. They'll bully. They'll threaten. They'll direct. They'll do any other kind of synonym to say, man, I'm so excited. Go do it. Don't worry. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you your contract. Don't do that. <laughs> Because just if it's not a contracting officer with the team working together, there is no meeting of the minds. There's no quid pro quo that can happen. So just be careful as you go and make those those allies, those champions, you need to qualify. You need to verify. You need to validate that the team is together before you actually start bending metal. Because if you start bending metal, I guarantee you, and nobody knows about it, you might go down spending tons and tons of money, and you're going to, you're going to, Take it in the chin because there's no way that you're going to get that money back. Anything? Nope. Last, last comments on that? No? You got it. All right. Next slide, please, sir. All right. So here we are, rounding third base into home. Then we'll take a quick break and we'll introduce our next guest. But how do we get plugged in? I bet you're probably thinking, so before we even go there, okay, again, who's motivated? Who's scared? Who's scared? <laughs> who's motivated? All right, cool. We got a few more folks. Cool. We got more motivation. I love it. After this afternoon, hopefully all of you guys are going to be motivated because this is, again, it's a journey and it's a challenge, but that's why we're entrepreneurs. We have grit, right? Entrepreneurs have grit. And if you want to change and be a change to the American fabric, you've got to have courage, right? So how do you get plugged in? First thing first is what? What are we going to do? Register. We're going to register. Why are we going to register? I can't find you if you're not registered. <laughs> That's right. So you got to register and get your certifications to do business with the government. We've got a person, a great man right here. His name's Curtis. He's going to teach you a little bit about that here earlier. So if you, don't, if you haven't registered or you're having problems with any types of certifications to do business with the government that you've uh, seen today or in the past, we have the folks here. So make sure. Step one, register and get your certification. Step two, find your ideal entry point. What do you do? Yeah, you got a list of them there. You got uh, the icon down there in the corner has mm-hmm. a connection to all the other innovation sales uh, yeah. out there. It really, yeah. whoever you think is going to consume your product first and fastest, yeah. start there. And then uh, folks like myself, mm-hmm. RapidX, we are here to do reverse BD, essentially. I'm here to assist you with connection mm-hmm. and uh, understanding. So reach out to us. I have a mm-hmm. cohort of about 300 folks now behind me uh, and all the match comms across the Air Force uh, certainly have OSD mm-hmm. on the co- on the mm-hmm. speed dial and others. So yeah, connect and start having a conversation. Yeah. Again, no one else is doing market research except me contracting mm-hmm. and I can only do market research in places like beta.sam. So if you're not there, I can't find you. Yep. And know those innovation hubs. When you click that QR code, I'm giving, the, you guys, I'm giving you guys gold because most people are like, how do I find this? This QR code has everything in there, all the different innovation hubs that are going to help Sherpa you and give you direction or signaling as to where you should go for more information, right? And not only that, plug yourself into where it makes sense. You know, if you're making a tank, don't go to AFWorks. They're not buying tanks. The Army probably is, Right. So that's what you want to do. You want to do the research, do a little bit of BD on your own, look at these websites and say, what are they interested in and does it align with my passion? If what their interest aligns with your passion, it's probably your favorite innovation hub. 
So make sure you do that and then you check them often because they're always putting out different requirements and different interests that come out almost, almost every month. There's something, a new movement that's going. The, the, the machine moves and does not tell anybody, but that QR code is going to give you an opportunity to at least find out where to sign up and where to get information or get informed automatically. We're starting to automate things in the government. Um, you have that opportunity to get on a listserv. All right, third thing, find a DOD Sherpa. Enjoy a professional defense acquisition or innovation network. Why is that important? So again, that connection to, mm -hmm. uh, so like being in this facility, we've run into dozens of companies mm -hmm. that we have now uh, attached to end user stakeholders and uh, started the process of commercial consumption of their goods and services that otherwise mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a relationship mm -hmm. that was established outside of traditional market research and contracting mechanisms. One thing I would concern, mm -hmm. uh, caution you with on the Sherpa piece, and you can mm -hmm. speak to this too, that Sherpa relationship is personality driven. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that uh, all, especially active duty, we move one to every one to three years. Once we divorce from an organization, that requirement for all intents and purposes dies with that organization or wh whomever comes behind us. So uh, mm -hmm. Sherpas are great in the time that you have them, but they can go away very quickly. Uh, and uh, in conjunction with that on step four, you know, mm -hmm. that commercial application is critical because the government is a fickle and schizophrenic customer and budgets go away very quickly. Uh, despite having mm -hmm. a formalized contractual relationship, at any given time, I can be told to cut off the contract. We will negotiate what that buyout looks like, but that stream will go away and you have no recourse. Yeah. That is our government unilateral right, so keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Sherpas are great, they're fleeting. Uh, commercial mm -hmm. traction is imperative. Yep, so be part of that network. Capital Factory is a great one. Right? We have the Center for Defense Innovation, again, eighth floor. Plus, that's where all the various defense partners are at. I'm there. I mean, collectively, between Jessica Steinhoff, myself, guys like Chase, we have another gentleman, uh, retired Colonel Marco Cervantes. We have almost 100 years of acquisition procurement experience. So between our teams here, we can definitely help Sherpa you or help point you in the right direction to find the right mentors, the right connections. And then again, that gaining that commercial traction for, while you build that government go-to-market strategy, use your Sherpas to help build that strategy before you jump into the pool. Because if you go in there and you don't know, you don't have a strategy, you don't understand what's happening, you will drown. So I want to keep you guys alive. The whole purpose for Capital Factory is I want to see you guys exit, scale, become part of the American industrial fabric. That's what we want to do. So let us help you get there. And lastly, as we kind of wrap up, I want to go ahead and, Jeremy, tell us again, inspire us, right? Why do we need these guys? So I'm really excited that you guys are here, and you guys are literally the ability for us to operationalize innovation, entrepreneurship, and what we need in our country to be able to protect our homeland and to continue the global enterprise that we are operating under. The world is getting more and more complex with AI and everything's becoming instantaneous and it's difficult for us as the operators to be able to wrap our heads around everything that we need and we need to be reliable to execute. So we literally need your guys' ideas. We need your free thinking. We need the fact that you're part of a democratic republic that enables us to be free and open to empower us to continue to execute in the manner that we do and to continue to excel in what it is to make sure that you're all free and that we're all safe. So thank you guys. Yeah, thank you for bringing us home. And that's why, again, just like we're, I'm gonna echo that, we need entrepreneurs just like we had the Wright brothers that brought heavier than air aviation to us, right? They brought the airplane. We need to do that again. We need to bring again um, our leadership in technology in all industry sectors, all industry sectors. We had, Computing, AI, ML, hypersonics, you name it. You saw 14 areas there. They're there not because we like it. We're there because we need it. So I want to thank you guys all for coming for this portion of it. I'd love for you guys to take a quick break, and we're going to transition to our other partners. So there's a lot more to learn here. And then remember, this afternoon, we're going to have a happy hour, provide networking, more conversation, more learning. Be here, free beer. This is awesome. Thank you, guys. We're going to take right. a four-minute break, and we'll pick back up um, with business development.